Today, we are celebrating the release of Dialog version 16, which is available on all platforms uh, with some restrictions that I'll get to uh, from today. The RIDE version 4 is being released simultaneously on Windows, Mac, and Linux. And if you haven't already seen the web pages, I think they're going live uh, as we speak. The last things may come tomorrow, the last emails, announcements, and, and tweets, and so on. Okay, but version 16 is it's, um, it's a little bit, it's interesting process sitting down and, and thinking about the release that's going out and preparing to present it. Usually by this time, as developers, uh, we're absolutely sick of a release and we don't really want to talk any more about it. And we've managed to iron out the last bugs and we'd really prefer to be looking at the next release. But looking back at this release, I did realize that this is actually a little bit of a milestone. There are some very major uh, firsts in version 16, some of them not entirely baked, but nonetheless marking, I think, the beginning of some, some new platforms and frameworks that are going to become very significant in, in the years to come. One of the most important is that for the first time, I think, since 1988, when we released Quad SM, we are providing a cross-platform user interface framework that we intend to make available on all of the platforms where APL is available. Um, it's the first uh, version of APL where we're really distributing core utilities and tools in the form of Unicode source files. There have been a few .NET samples and so on in the past, but this is the first time where they're really becoming key components of the system. We believe we've solved uh, an ancient language design problem. I can certainly remember this being discussed at the first APL conferences I went to back in, in the 80s, uh, coming up with a primitive language uh, construct to merge arrays. And we finally feel confident that we have a good design for that, and it's in version 16, the at operator. Um, the stencil operator is also a bit of a breakthrough, we feel, because it makes APL much more efficient for a class of problems where we felt for a very long time that APL should be efficient, but, but hasn't been quite as good as we would like. With the stencil operator, APL becomes much more efficient for image manipulation, neural networks, and that kind of problem where you're looking at a neighborhood around the cells in, in an array. There's an interval index function, iota underbar, which provides very efficient bucketing or classification, another problem that occurs very frequently in applications and now has a, a good solution, we feel. Uh, on the interface side, there are new system functions to convert APL arrays to and from uh, very popular file formats, CSV. Uh, Richard presented this in the first webinar and I think one of the questions we got was why didn't you do that 20 years ago? Uh, to which Richard fortunately could uh, just answer he wasn't here 20 years ago. Um, but it's about time and I'm very pleased that we've done it. JSON of course is a much more modern format and uh, we haven't been quite as late in supporting that. The Conga TCP library, which be is becoming more and more important as people start building uh, more lightweight uh, applets, uh, microservices, etc. Uh, Conga is really becoming a, very much a core component of, of the APL system. Has had a major, uh, has a major new release with lots of new functionality. And then there's the remote IDE, the graphical um, development environment which was the standard on Mac with version 15 and now becoming the standard interface also on Linux. Um, has a Workspace Explorer and many new features. Okay, so I've uh, put up a little progress bar along the top um, with the topics that I'm going to go through. I'm going to limber up with some things that, some demonstrations that I feel very confident are going to work, the core language primitives and then we'll move on to more esoteric demos that uh, I'm hoping will work towards the end of the presentation. So take a really easy one first, one where people might even wonder why we did it. The monadic enclose underbar or right shoe underbar simply ensures that an array 
is nested. So it encloses the array if simple. And the, the reason for, the, the primary motivation for it is the example that's up on the, on the screen now. That if you're writing a function that takes an array argument where there might be a varying number of parameters, then strand notation collapses it to a simple array if there's only one item. And this is a, is a construct we found we were writing utility functions for in virtually every application that we, we ever wrote and uh, therefore decided that it deserved to be a primitive. So the expression on the last line is the one you might write on the first line of this kind of uh, application function. Ravel the enclosive simple of the argument and then you know how many elements you've been passed. The dyadic version of uh, right shoe underbar is going to be the APL2 partition function um, which is available of course if quadml is 2 or 3 but we've decided it's so useful that we'd like it to be available always um, so the definition is is the same as the right shoe with quadml 2 or 3 and uh, of course the long-term goal of this is that we're um, Trying to get rid of QuadML, of course, we um, we are, won't be able to get rid of it because there will be legacy, uh, sorry, heritage code using it for many, many years to come. Um, but we would at least like to remove it from documentation so that new users to APL do not need to uh, to learn about it. Uh, of course, it'll remain available for as long as any, there's any significant use of it. Okay, so now maybe some slightly more interesting primitives that really provide new functionality. Um, there's a WHERE function, which actually you could argue is, is the same as the omega slash iota omega uh, primitive, which is down at the bottom, except it's extended to higher ranks. And of course, having that available as a primitive functionality allows you to synthesize bigger and more powerful idioms. We'll demonstrate that uh, in a moment. The dyadic form of iota under bar is the interval index, which allows you to classify data or into buckets. So the left argument, uh, in this case at the top 0, 10, 25, 75, mark the partitions in a classification. And the result tells you into which bucket uh, an argument fits. It works not only with um, numeric and character vectors, as we can see in this example, but also with matrices. And I think it's time to, to do a little demo and show how it works. Let's see, here we go. Okay, so where an abelian vector tells you where the ones are. For the simple boolean vector case, it's the same um, as the old idiom, except that it's stricter, it requires booleans only. One of the differences being that it extends directly to two-dimensional arrays. And of course, it allows you to do right expressions like this, or Something that people should start thinking about is using two trains of functions and writing code like this. So the iota, oh sorry, the where equals, um, both because it, it's easier, at least in this case, to read, and also because it's more likely that we might one day optimize that because it's a very easy task to, relatively easy task to optimize an expression like that. The interval index, So in this case, uh, that's the, the simple case. So the zero is before the first bucket point and gets the number zero. If we used quad IO zero, then all the results would be one lower than before. It also works for characters. The left argument has to be uh, sorted. Otherwise, you will get an error, at least in this example. Uh, sorry, in this version of APL. So a worked example, no points for guessing who created this example. 
if we have uh, we have four grades of olive oil and we have three we therefore have three uh, fence posts um, we can then do the iota underbar and we can then construct a result here that shows what the various acidities which grades the various acidities refer to one of the perhaps unexpected things is that you can also use this to do classification with the left argument with which is a matrix so in this case we have some timestamp keys which are a three column matrix of hour minute and second and we have some data and if we wanted to do a partitioned we wanted to uh, sum that data by 15 um, minute intervals then we could create this variable quarters we have a look at the beginning of that it starts with 0 0 0 and then every 15 minutes up to 2345 there is a, a border um, we can then compute the quarter totals let's see if we put on the quarters on the front of that we can compute the, the the quarterly totals and we can see here that the dyadic um, the the uh, interval index is a function that goes very well together with key so we use the interval index to compute where in um, a set of keys the data belongs and then use key to compute the sums or count the number of items etc okay so that was iota underbar the next primitive we're going to look at is the at operator. And as, as I mentioned in the introduction, this is really a, almost a, a holy grail problem, something that we've been looking at for very many years, been discussing different solutions to this and never feeling that we'd come up with something that was so good that it was worth implementing. But we now have uh, an operator which uh, we'll do an extensive demo of in a second, which we feel um, covers all the different types of functionality that we, we wanted to hit. The, the sort of the obvious uh, use case for it is the one that's on the slide at the moment, where before, if you wanted to replace elements of, of an array by data that came from somewhere else or was modified using other data, you would have to do an indexed assignment. And the problem with that is that you make you uh, you writing expressions that have side effects. So an expression like that is difficult to multi-thread. It's difficult to compile. Whereas the functional form at the bottom doesn't have any side effects. It simply has it is it's effectively a uh, a function with three arguments, if you like. There are four because there's also a function in addition to the data that you the three items of data that you're merging. Um, but it's um, it's a complete, it's more powerful, it avoids temporary names, it's more compilable, and so on. So let's have a look at some examples of that. This operator is the brainchild of John Scholes, really, although m many people have had input to it, and these examples are also mostly uh, his work to copy a few defense he's going to use clear the screen and as you can see John's been working for this at least for five years but I think the history actually goes back uh, goes back longer than this so here's the example that we were the classical example without that that we would like to um, improve on and the way to write that is 10 times at 2 4 iota 5 with the at operator. The left operand, in this case multiplication, is the modifier. And it's a dyadic function, so we could be using two different items on the left, multiplying one item by 10 and the other by 100. Uh, we could also use a dyadic function uh, left, in which case we're not multiplying anything, we're simply replacing with the items on the left. The function, the, um, uh, 
the function on the left, the modifier, is applied to the items that are selected. So we can also do things like this with a monadic function and reverse items 2 and 4 in the array. And finally, there's a shorthand form, so instead of using the function left, you can simply apply an array as the left operand, the modifier, and simply replace directly with the indices that are provided. The right operand, which has been 2, 4 so far, is the selector. Applies to character as well. And if the selector, instead of being a... Uh, a set of indices is a function. It's expected to be a selection function that returns booleans, which will take the, um, the right argument as its argument and produce a boolean. So in this case, we're replacing all the, all the vowels, all the positions where A is an element of A, E, I, O, U with star. If we use a function on the left, lowercase, then we can lowercase everything, in this case, which is not an element of A, E, I, O, U. And it applies to higher rank arguments. If we use the classical uh, example, we could have selected rows 2 and 4. With at, the, um, we do selection on the leading, on the major cells. And if you wanted to replace the columns, then you can use the rank operator so that you apply the, the lev at 2, 4 on each vector in the right argument. Um, so you can also, although you're selecting major cells, the combination of selecting major cells and using rank allows you to operate on other dimensions than the leading dimension. So in this case, we're selecting the second and the fourth row and reversing them. If we use the trace operator, which was copied from the defense um, workspace, we can see that a more detailed explanation. <laughs> I've just had a comment here that uh, people would like a more detailed explanation. I'm afraid since this is only the highlights of version 16, that isn't going to be possible. Uh, in fact, I'm spending too much time on this example as it is. I think I have something like 20, 20 demos I need to get through. The good news for this particular demonstration is that it's, uh, it's treated in much more depth by John Scholes himself in a presentation from um, last year's conference. So if you go to video.dialog.com and the... Um, the 16 conference, there's a video by John Scholes going into much more depth here. So this last example just shows that the, um, the reverse function was re applied to those two rows, two and four that were selected, produced that result which was then merged into the, the five by five matrix. The um, forms of indexing that use Enclosed arrays for selections, like choose indexing, are also supported. So in this case, we're on the right-hand side. We have we've generated one, one, two, two, three, three. So we can uh, choose in a matrix and replace it. We can also do uh, reach indexing into a nested structure and replace items in a deeply or merge. I shouldn't say replace. If John is listening. Please forgive me, John, if I, when I say replace, <laughs> because I realize that's a very unfunctional way of describing it. These things are being merged. Nothing is being replaced. Um, we can apply, uh, you know, use the standard operator uh, chaining so that we are doing the 10 times at 2, 4 to the power 2. So the numbers are being multiplied by 100. Uh, including inverses. I'm afraid I'm going to have to speed up a bit because uh, I'm, I'm spending a little bit more time on this than I expected to, but the Boolean functions really allow you to do some quite beautiful things. So in this case we're saying multiply by a hundred where the two residue is one. So that multiplies by a hundred the uh, odd items in an array. 
And if we use the PCO function, which returns zero PCO will return one if a number is um, a prime, sorry, if it's not prime, uh, then we can create this wonderful pattern of, uh, of prime numbers in a matrix. So to summarize at, um, it may seem a little bit esoteric to begin with. I think it's one of those things that once you get into it, it's going to grow on you and you'll find you're using them all over the place to avoid temporary variables and to help you think uh, more clearly about uh, merging and modifying data. Shorter expressions, you don't need um, temporary names, you can embed these things as sub-expressions, you don't need to create a function in order to, to get isolation. And you can apply it to each rank, power, and, and other operators, you can combine it. So that was at, I'm sure, uh, sorry, it was both too long and too short at the same time. I apologize to people on both sides of that, but we're going to have to move on. There's rather a lot of stuff in version 16. So the stencil operator, um, this one perhaps has less applicability uh, than at for most existing applications, but it opens APL up to a new class of applications uh, where there probably are few commercial uh, applications of APL today. So a stencil operation is a very common operation in image manipulation, um, fluid dynamics, neural networks, and so on, where you're writing code which inspects the neighbors of a cell. And quite simply, stencil applies its left operand function to a neighborhood of the size specified by the right operand. So in this simple example, which is up on the screen now, um, we're applying just enclose omega to neighborhoods of size three. And if you look carefully, you can see that each item of the right argument, one, two, three, four, appears exactly once as the center of a neighborhood. And the default, which is the only option available at the moment, pads with fill elements on the left and right to give you complete cells. There are plans in future releases to provide options to give you stencils on a torus uh, without fill elements and so on. There's probably three or four different um, um, variants of that. Let's take a look at um, some examples of this. Why would you? Why would you use this? How would you use it? So here's the the example we just looked at to to refresh the definition. Uh, we apply the function once for each item of the right argument with the window of the size on the right. So a very typical thing would be to sum the elements. So this gives us the length three moving sum on the array, which we can of course already do in other ways with APL. Um, here are the size five windows, the same thing. Shape of the result is the shape of the argument. I've already said that twice. So let's look at some classical stencil operations. Uh, this would be an example from image manipulation. So a diagonal here represents an image where there's a very clear colored line going through it. A blur stencil is a very common operation. So in this case, we're, we create a stencil which has the highest value in the middle and smaller values the further you get away from the center. So it's taking contributions from neighbors in some proportion to the distance from the center. And of course, you can use all kinds of different sizes of blurs and different algorithms for how to compute the numbers. If you want to apply a stencil like that to an array, I found this uh, function apply is useful. You give it the stencil on the left, then it applies a function we need to name the stencil here so we can use it as a global inside because instead of just doing a plus reduction of what's in each neighborhood, we multiply the neighborhood um, by the stencil. And so we're doing a weighted plus reduction. So if we apply blur to the diagonal, 
we can see that it has indeed blurred it. If we were to display that as an image, we'd see something which had been blurred. So if we have some data, um, so we started out, sorry, this, you can't see the data I started with here. I started out with something which was just this zeros or sixes in a matrix, and then I applied the blur and called it box. So now I've got something that's blurred. And if I wanted to sharpen it, I might use an edge detection stencil. And an edge detection stencil, again, there are all sorts of variations of this depending on what you're trying to do, typically has a, a number in the middle and then it'll have negative numbers surrounding it. And the effect of that is when you apply this to a region, it will give you a very small number if there's relatively little change in the region. But if there's significant change happening, happening in that region, then you'll get a number which is different, um, which is significantly different. And if you apply that to the box, you can see that we get, we've got something that look like edges here. We've got big numbers where we have the transition from the zeros to the higher values. So if we apply the um, this transformation to the blurred box, we get something which, uh, you know, um, where we apply some limit value, we can find out where the edges were. Now, uh, su surprisingly, um, it also, you can also use stencils for the game of life. So here's the classical uh, YouTube version of um, the expression for the next generation of Conway's game of life. And if we construct the the archetypal glider pattern. We apply life to the glider, it gives us the next generation in Conway's game of life. Uh, now, if you use some weights where you weight the neighbors by two and the center by one, and you apply that to the cellular automaton uh, pattern, then if the result of doing the weights is either five, six, or seven, according to Conway's rules, then you should have a one in the next generation. So we have a much, much simpler way to describe the game of life computation um, with the stencil operator and very, very much more efficient as well. And I can see I've lost the last corrections to my demos here. So we can write a function generation which applies life omega times to the pattern alpha, and then we can apply 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 times to the glider pattern and see that, in fact, the glider is gliding. Yep. Okay, so back to PowerPoint. And I think that's the end of the, the language part, so maybe this is a good time to take questions on the language features. Um, Shall we take a two minute break and allow questions before we move on to um, some file manipulation demos? The next couple of features in version 16 that I'd like to give you just a very, this is going to be a very brief demonstration compared to the language ones because Richard covered these, I think, both in, in some detail in the first webinar. So if you're interested in them, you can go back and watch the first half of uh, the first webinar. Um, so, you know, the, the XML tool that we provided some time ago, Quad CSV and Quad JSON, are all tools that essentially convert between APL arrays that are in you know, a suitable form to, to be represented as JSON, CSV, and so on. So for CSV, it would typically be matrices. Uh, and these external formats. Um, CSV is very, very old. As Richard points out, there's really no standard for it. And, and uh, I know Richard struggled quite a bit in the specification to decide, you know, look at very many different implementations in Excel and, and other tools to decide exactly what uh, types of CSV files we should, we should support. There's still room to, to tweak the design. So if you have things you're missing, please do get in touch with us, get in touch with Richard. Okay, so back to, I'm going to start with quad CSV. So here's some data, my favorite APL matrix 
which I would like to represent as a comma separated value file. And in version 16, all I need to do is put it on the left side of quad CSV and put the name of the file on the right and bang, it has done it. Um, and if I want to read it back, um, yeah, I don't quite get back what I wanted to do. I should have had this as the next thing in the demo. Maybe I do, but if I tell it that the column types are two, all two, which means numeric, then in fact I will get back exactly what I started with. But by default, it doesn't know that the the values, or it, it isn't allowed to guess that the values are all always going to be numeric. If I were to replace some of the values. Um, and now I'm going to make a slight detour to give an ad for some functions which I think came in in version 15. So if I want to get rid of that file because I'm going to overwrite it, I could call quad n delete and then check with quad ex exists that it's not there. And I could even call this very, very useful utility function. Uh, this is really a bit of a digression, but it's, it's something I think people should know about. If you didn't notice this in version 15, this function is really worth uh, picking up on. What quad n parts does is it splits a file name into three parts, the, the folder name, which is the first element, the file name without the extension, which is the second element, and the extension as the final element. And it has a left argument, which if you give it a one, it will interpret or it'll normalize, standardize the file name uh, relative to the current working directory. So we can find out, say, if we were to create a file with this name, dot, dot, backslash, iota12, where would it actually go? And of course, that means that in list of one quad in parts, nothing at all tells you the current directory, um, which I, you can see is different in version 16 from what it was in earlier versions. It's no longer uh, Windows System 32 by default, but we put you in your, your own documents folder so it's easier to save stuff. Okay, so I can now write that back. Uh, the matrix, remember it now has characters in the second column. And if I read it back now with quad n get, which is a function that came in in version 16, uh, it returns in the first element all of the text from a file with all new lines converted to line feeds. It tells you the encoding and it tells you the line endings that it found in the file. If I say I'd like to read it and I know that the column types are 2122, two, two, I get this nested array. Um, and then the final thing I think is which is worth talking about in Quad CSV is that it has an inverted option so that if you prefer to get the data back as homogeneous vectors, one for each column, because you know the data types will fit that, then you can do that. And that's much more efficient in terms of the data representation that you get. You can choose between uh, getting your character data back as a matrix with inverted style one or as a vector of vectors with, with style two. The next, the, so that's all on CSV. If you want to see more about that, go and watch the previous uh, webinar. Moving on to JSON. I'm going to create a namespace with two variables in it. And then I'm going to create a three element vector which consists of an integer, a character vector, and that namespace. And then I'm going to pass it to JSON. By default, JSON will convert to JSON. Uh, if the right argument is not a character vector, we'll get to that in a second. And it'll give you the um, JSON representation of a three element vector with an integer, a string, and then an object with two names inside it. Um, if we were to pass it a character vector, um, which is JSON, then it will convert that. In this case, we have two objects in there, uh, both of them having variables called A and B. So we get a vector of namespaces back. This is actually something that was quite controversial in the development team, the, the self-inverse nature of quad JSON. And if you think that's a really bad idea, then you can say, you can give it a left argument of zero to say, I want it to be not JSON. 
uh, one to say that you want the result to be JSON and uh, protect yourself from the day where the heuristic goes wrong. Might happen, though I can't think of a case. Okay, shall we take questions on CSV and JSON or there's nothing coming in? Not at the moment. Conga. So as I mentioned uh, in the introduction, the the use of TCP and and H, the, maybe the HTTP protocol in particular are really becoming central to the development of new applications. I think of of the new APL projects I'm aware of, you know, have looked at at various customer sites. I think there's almost isn't a single one that doesn't involve. Uh, TCP communications in some form. People are building, you know, for new applications or for new features of old applications, uh, people are generally uh, dividing applications up into small pieces and making them web services or using other protocols, may, maybe homegrown protocols, but generally basing it all on, on TCP in one form or another. Uh, and for that reason, we've um, you know, there have been a lot of requests for enhancements and we've spent very significant time on, on enhancements to Conga. So there are um, new threading models for improved scalability, uh, simpler coding. So we, um, we recognize uh, sometimes people have very, very lightweight transactions, but huge volumes. Uh, other times people have a small number of users connected to a server, but it's doing much more sophisticated things. And there are new ways to declare, you know, what kind of server this is and get either better performance or easier coding, um, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, you can now isolate multiple uses of Congo. One thing we found was that uh, people started using development tools based on TCP. I think the um, the Acre source code management system, for example, is written in APL and uses uses Conga. And of course, you want the development tool to be able to use TCP sockets without interfering with any use that the uh, the application itself might have of the sockets. Uh, so we've provide now in version three provides a mechanism where you can create multiple routes we call them for Conga and have isolation between different tools that are, are using Conga. Uh, because HTTP is so important, we've built into the Conga layer the ability to parse HTTP, incoming HTTP messages so that you don't have to do any buffering and collecting yourself, but you just get headers and data and chunks and whatever. You're receiving as individual messages makes the programming much simpler and as an extension to that you can now have web sockets um, so both as a server and as a, a client you can participate in this asynchronous um, HTTP communications if you're a web server that needs to transmit large files you can now get Conga to transmit them for you without first reading them uh, into the workspace and then passing them on the configuration is simpler. You don't, if you don't need secure features, you don't need to distribute the extra two megabyte um, secure DLL. And you also don't need to set lib path or other environment variables to allow Conga to find all of its DLLs. You just put everything in the same place and, and it should all run. So configuration and so on is easier. There's some experimental support for UDP datagrams. That's mostly for gaming or, or that kind of highly interactive um, multi-user applications. That isn't actually documented. It's still very experimental. If you want to play with that, get in touch with us and we'll, we'll show you what there is. We've been experimenting with the APL code that wraps Conga to make it easier to get started uh, writing your own servers and so on. And I'm going to demonstrate those, some of those in a minute. Uh, and the final highlight, there's, there's more features than this, but the one I think is worth mentioning is that you can set up filters on IP address ranges so that uh, anybody who tries to connect to you outside the uh, address ranges or from a blacklisted address your, AP, your application code won't even hear of it. It'll get um, disconnected before it, it gets that far. 
Before I do the, the demonstration of Conga, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, um, the new way of, of distributing source because the, the tools surrounding Conga are the first set of, of tools that we're really distributing in this form. Um, so uh, distinguishing at the moment, maybe that this is very a bit fuzzy, but a tool is, I call, something that you use during development, whereas a library is something that your application would use at runtime. Um, but most of the new tools and libraries that we're creating will be distributed as Unicode text files containing APL source, rather than the old binary form of distributing data. We may continue to distribute some workspaces as well, if that's more convenient for, for some of you. But we really see most users and including the what you might call the heritage applications are really now wanting to switch to using uh, Git or SVN or Mercurial text based source code management. And we really see that as uh, you know, the way to deliver APL source code and then build projects from that uh, in the future. So in the new, in version 16, there are two folders below the main dialog folder. There's one called library, which exclusively contains uh, utilities uh, as Unicode text files. And then there's a folder called samples, which is a mixture of old stuff, which has been distributed for the last many years. And some folders like the samples conga, uh, which is all in, in textual format. For the libraries that we distribute with um, the interpreter, even though we're bundling with them with the interpreter, what we're actually doing is taking a snapshot of some GitHub repositories that are open source and public. So the HTML renderer um, is what we believe is a framework for a user interface um, that'll work on all platforms and will be good for the next decade or maybe two. The, as, as a framework, there may be uh, different tools required to generate the HTML that it's going to render. Those are the things that we need to work on a little bit uh, in the years to come. But there are already prototypes that you can play with. Um, so the HTML renderer adds something called the Chromium Embedded Framework, which is the rendering engine from Google Chrome to Dialog APL. Um, it's working under Windows. It's almost working on the Mac, and we expect to have it working on Linux within a month or month and a half. We shall see. Um, so the trick is you need to be able to generate HTML, CSS, JavaScript in some way or you need to create portals uh, that pick um, widgets or, or content up from from other sources so the tools we do have some tools to help you generate user interface definitions and this is something i talked about in uh, at some depth in the first webinar so if this interests you the second half of the first webinar is is much more about this than you're going to see now. But uh, I'm going to do a couple of short demos. Okay, cross-platform user interfaces. So, back in 1988, we had cross-platform user interfaces. We had this thing called QuadSM and it worked on all the platforms where Dialog APL was available, which was, yeah, now I'm not sure, you see, Quad SM, Andy will kill me for showing it to you at all because it's not supposed to be supported. It does not work on high DPI screens and we are not going to fix it, <laughs> I don't think, uh, to, to do that. So the font there is, is very, very small. Uh, but don't worry about it. It's just showing you the state of the art user interfaces in, uh, in 1988. Are you talking about the APL session? We are hoping that it will work on the Raspberry Pi. Yes, that may be a little bit more than six, week, six weeks away. But the plan is to, can, once we have Intel Linux working, we'll continue to the Raspberry Pi. 
All right, so enough about Quad SM. The new tool, the sort of the uh, the entry level example of it is Hello APLers in an HTML renderer. So you can create it either using Quad New or use the old format, which I still uh, prefer in demos because it's it's slightly more it's shorter. The arguments are shorter with Quad WC. So you create an object called an HTML renderer, and the first property uh, in the default order is simply the HTML that you inject into it. So this creates this in, creates an instance of the Chromium embedded framework and injects this HTML into it. The HTML renderer is a, a window object uh, like the others you'll see here I asked for the list of properties and they're a lot of the same ones that you would have with a form um, so we can set the size uh, of the window I realize that window is really quite small but it's not really important that you see what's in it I can refer to an external HTML resource I can say I have a logo which is somewhere on the dialog page uh, icon.png and this little tag here which says there's an image and its source is somewhere else outside uh, my system I can just catenate that to the HTML and now the window got a little bit too small so I'll increase its size by 50 pixels yeah now under Windows if you're using Microsoft Windows in fact you can combine the HTML renderer with the regular Quad WC GUI. So I've created a form here, a regular Windows form, and I'm going to copy the PCO function, which gives us prime numbers. We saw that in the at demo, and I'm going to put some prime numbers up in a grid, and then I'm going to set the title height width and the cell width so that it looks nice. So this is still, this is not HTML, right? Now I'm just doing regular uh, Quad WC Win32 GUI. I add a label, but now I'm embedding as a child an HTML renderer object. And I'm then setting its URL property to be, has the Large Hadron Collider destroyed the world yet? And that then goes, that directs that web browser which is embedded there to go to the Hadron Collider status page and give us the reassuring message that we're still okay. And then I went to our Twitter feed at Dialog and I went clicked on something and it gave me, Twitter gave me a bit of a snippet of HTML, um, a reference to twitter.com Dialog APL. I just copy pasted that off a Twitter page and I'm creating another instance of the HTML renderer here and into that I'm putting embedding that piece of HTML which retrieves Dialog's Twitter feed. So on Windows you can start combining external uh, you can sort of write portal applications using external resources. Um, yep. But we probably want to write our own cross-platform applications. So here's a little example that we've put together. Ah, there is already a stop in the callback. So let's call simple form, quote, quote, and trace it. So what this function is doing is these lines up here at the top are simply generating some HTML. The first seven or eight lines are creating a title which will become the caption of the form then there's a form and some there's a table where the first column is a label and the second column is an input field and then there's two buttons with the name OK and cancel so we don't have time to go into explaining that this is just to to illustrate the concept so if you if you simply write APL code which generates HTML in some form and then you set the event on the HTTP request object up to call. We're going to call the same function again. Um, oops. The function 
looks at it arg its argument. If the argument is empty, it's in setup mode. If the argument is not empty, it's in callback mode, and it will come back here, and we'll get to that in a second. So we set up the callback, we create an HTML renderer and inject that HTML, then it renders, you know, creates a window, renders that HTML. And of course, the important thing here is this doesn't look particularly pretty. You can then spend time with cascading style sheets and set colors and add icons and so on, or you can get somebody in your in your IT organization who knows how to do that to create the resources for the for you that you just link in. Um, and there's the form. And if we type something and click OK, it works. We get come into the callback mode. Here we're using ah I forgot Somehow I managed to lose the last changes to my demos. Um, this HTTP utils again is a utility f uh, namespace for dealing with HTTP requests. What's happening here is that we get a callback which contains an HTTP request in exactly the same way as if this had been a real web server. And we need to use, we have tools to take those apart and allow you to re react to this in a way as if you were a web server but much more immediately able to make changes to the um, to the form so we can see here that we have um, form data the HTTP utils uh, HTTP request function has created a namespace for us from the request that tells us the names and the values of the data in the form and we can also see that the OK button was pressed. Um, and then we then have a switch on whether the OK button was pressed, we create an HTTP response, extract the values of first and last, do a bit of delta, uh, data manipulation, say welcome the name that we've extracted and then we create a response which we send back to the HTML renderer and it says welcome. So that's sort of the simple, uh, the simple example. The HTML renderer, we hope, with a little bit more work on these tools for generating HTML, is going to give us a replacement for Quad WC um, cross-platform based on creating HTML, CSS, JavaScript documents and integrating documents that you create with things that the rest of your IT organization or, or external providers are creating. The other piece of being able to, to operate cross-platform to development and debugging is to have uh, an integrated development environment that also works on all platforms and is able to debug code running on all the platforms. And RIDE, which now has a version number of 4.0, is is the tool that we're um, developing for that and it's you know it's uh, still lags a bit behind the windows ide in terms of uh, functionality but in this release we've added uh, a workspace explorer which was one perhaps the biggest thing that was missing in version 3 stack and thread windows support for function keys uh, uh, and menu items that were missing. And one of the really exciting things, uh, which is still in its infancy, is the ability to do installation-free operation. And I think I'd like to start by showing that since we don't have that much time left. Uh, we can carry on a bit after, after half past, but I was really hoping we could uh, keep it to 90 minutes. So if I start uh, Dialog APL, with a, well, I should show one more, PowerPoint. If we want to run RIDE installation free, as we're calling it, that gives you the ability to de develop and debug it applications running in an APL process from anywhere without first having to install the RIDE. What you need to do is you have to have write installed on the server so that all the HTML and JavaScript files which define write are present 
where the APL process is running. And you then start APL with a switch that tells it to um, to have a, a it says direction could be listen or or um, serve. You could start ride in either as a listener or a um, or as a client. But the configuration file also says we're going to be an HTTP server and it gives the name of the folder where the ride files have been installed. So you see in that the second last line of this says that there's a folder with the ride for resources where they are located. If you want to start a secure server, because uh, the, the any file that I showed before would allow anybody to connect to it, you can also say that you require the client side to have a particular certificate installed or otherwise have other characteristics that you can validate, be located at a particular IP address or subnet and so on. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start a secure APL server using the file we just looked at there. So we now have an APL process running, you know, running your running your application. And we can then go to web browser and we started it on 82, I think. HTTPS, it's secure localhost 8082. And it detects that it's connecting to, to a secure server and it wants to know which of my installed certificates I want to use. I want to use this one. And I allow it to use my private key, yes. And I now have a connection um, to the server. And I can show you the new debug window with the threads and the SI stack. Um, and the Workspace Explorer is over here. So all of the new functionality is available, or all of the functionality of Ride is available um, in this thing, with the exception of the ability to start a new, launch a new process. So this Ride session, which is connected to an APL process which has served up the files, is only able to um, to to be used with that server. It can't launch processes on the host process or any of the other features uh, like, uh, I mean, the, the standalone ride which is running on your desktop has the capability to launch new processes on that machine and also in version 4 using SSH um, to log on to a remote machine and launch <coughs> APL processes there. Okay, so Jason, are you able to, if I start an insecure server, do you think you'll be able to connect to it? We can try. So Jason has an Android, I think, tablet. Yep. Um, and I've just launched a new APL process here, which is just listening on port 8080 on my machine with no security because we couldn't be bothered to install the certificates on Jason's. Okay, so here, I don't know how visible this is on the, yep, not at all. There's a, <laughs> a ride session running on a, an Android um, device. I don't know that this works with absolutely all web browsers, but it certainly seems to work with Chrome um, and you seem to be able to type type stuff and edit functions yes. and it's it's a fully functional and this is because ride itself is an html javascript application when you run it on a desktop it's running inside a framework called electron uh, which is sort of creating something like the html renderer environment written in some other language um, so the ride is using HTML renderer like technology in order to be able to run on a desktop. Uh, and now you can also run it, um, you can have APL act as a server for the files and connect to it. At the moment, only one connection at a time. And I think that's not likely to, to change. I was going to, um, well, why don't I switch to my Mac since it's, yeah. Since things are going so well, 
I will switch to the Mac. So, um, what did I want to show? Well, have you disconnected? Yep. So I can show that from Chrome here on my Mac, nine, I could also access that APL session. Okay, so once Jason closed Chrome down completely on his device and it released the connection, I was able to pick up that connection from, from here on the Mac. We can also see here that uh, QuadSM, our old friend QuadSM, was also truly cross-platform. It does actually work on the Mac. Um, and let's see, do I dare try this on the Mac in the last few seconds, which have already, which have gone. If I load that simple form and I load HTTP utils and I run simple form here on the Mac and we all cross our fingers. There it is. Woohoo. So the HTML renderer does work on the Mac. So running a minute or so late. Um, to recap version 16, <clears throat> it is, uh, I think, you know, there, there are some pieces that are, um, if not half baked, but very fresh. And I think, you know, that would have been true for QuadSM in 1988 and for QuadWC itself um, back in 1990-ish. But I'm feeling that many of these things that we're distributing now for the first time really are the, the foundation of, of where we're going. So we have a cross platform, we have the beginnings of a cross platform UI framework. Uh, we have a new way to organize source code, manage source code, and build applications. Some very powerful new primitive uh, functions for writing efficient applications. Access to comma-separated value files, JSON. Conga is really evolving to a point where it's going to be able to support uh, microservices, I think they call them these days, is what everybody's supposed to be building. And Ride 4.0 is really reaching a point where it's, uh, it's usable if for developing, debugging almost any kind of application. And version 16 is also uh, quite a bit faster. We haven't quite been able to uh, avoid the, the little red tail this time. Last, last version 15 was so amazing we had uh, a huge blue section and no red at all. Some of the things, some of the features we've added in version 16 have had a little bit of a negative impact on some primitives, but overall the, the tests run a bit faster and I believe beta testers have also generally reported speed ups. Um, although we do have one or two people and you know who you are, who we're talking to about things that have slowed down and, uh, and how we speed them up again. As I said, it's, uh, I think it's, uh, a bit of a milestone or several milestones, a new platform for new types of applications and new ways of ex enhancing uh, old applications. I'd like to thank, there's a lot of people that dialogue, about tw 22 people that dialogue uh, beavering away on the system, but we're also getting more and more help from outside. So this, uh, for version 16, I'd like to thank uh, Callum, Mike and Gil from Optima for their work on the ride together with John Daintree. Uh, John's also had help on the HTML renderer uh, from Milos at Technology Partner in Belgrade, who we've been doing work with for the last year and a half. Um, really enhanced our technical capabilities. And of course, Kai, who provided ADOC has helped us with the design and test of, of so many things in the interpreter. Always breaking things first and last. So thank you, Kai. Well, thank you very much. I hope it was useful and enjoyable parts of it, at least. And uh, hope to see many of you again in about a month on Thursday, the 27th of July. Thank you very much.